here today all of our future scientists, engineers, and artists in the audience. My name is Lorraine Walsh, and I'm the art director and curator for the Simon Center Gallery. And I'm also a, a teacher here as well. I teach art. And I'm, uh, today, uh, we're, this is part of what's called the Della Pietra Lecture Series. And it's a wonderful series of lectures that's uh, made possible by a family, the Della Pietra family, and two brothers, Stephen and Vincent. So we're very, very grateful for them for supporting this endeavor. And the purpose of this lectureship is to bring to the Simon Center and Stony Brook the highest caliber of mathematicians, physicists, and scientists in general working at the leading edge of innovative and creative discovery and with the purpose to inspire us to learn and to think differently for important future inventions, these inventions that you will create. So it is my great pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Eric Heller. And uh, this talk is particularly special because Dr. Heller is a scientist and an artist. So in fact, in the gallery outside, you can see some of his beautiful prints. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have Dr. Heller here today. And his research is, um, he's known for his research on time-dependent quantum mechanics, as well as the beautiful digital prints he creates. Dr. Heller says that he creates his art as a way of conveying his research to, the, to a larger public through visual art. Um, so therefore, Dr. Heller is being celebrated here for both his scientific and artistic endeavors. As a distinguished scientist, Dr. Heller is the Abbott and James Lawrence Professor of Chemistry and Professor of Physics at Harvard University, where he received his PhD in 1973. He is an elected fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Association for the Advancements of Science, the American Physical Society, the National Academy of Science, and the International Academy of Quantum Molecular Science. Dr. Heller's many honors include the American Chemical Society Award in Theoretical Chemistry in 2005, the Astor Fellowship at Oxford in two, also in 2005, and the Joseph Hirschfelder Prize in 2003. Finally, Dr. Heller is a Sloan Fellow, a Humboldt Fellow, a Fellow of the American Physical Society, a Guggenheim, a Guggenheim Fellow, and the, a co-author of over 260 publications. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Heller. Well, thank you, Lorraine. Uh, with all those uh, honors, I ought to do pretty good. Uh, there are three lectures in the Della Pietra lecture series, which I'm very honored to be uh, giving today and tomorrow. Uh, I was told that this is the most important one. And the reason is that the donor family feels that way. So uh, I've done my best to do things which will interest you and you may remember. And uh, they have to do not so much with the art that I do or the time-dependent quantum mechanics, but sound and how you hear sound and, and uh, well, Let's begin. That is uh, one of my pieces of art that was used for uh, minus the lettering. Uh, and I'm going to begin by saying there's nothing that we know of in the universe that is not a wave at some level. You are made of waves. Matter is made of waves. And waves behave very similarly from one context to the next. Sound, light, matter waves, that's quantum mechanics. Of course, waves on a string, water waves. And actually, sound is the most accessible of all the waves. Uh, you, you, it's light waves that are intercepting your eye right now, but you can't really measure their length or hear them pulsate or see them pulsate. Uh, but sound, you can. Uh, now, with that introduction, we could make this a talk about the physics of waves. But that would be too much like physics class. By the way, before I um, go any further, you're not a random group of students from your high school, are you? You don't look random. 
I mean, you look like a pretty intelligent crowd. Are most of you uh, taking some science in high school? Well, that's good. Um, and you had to sign up and so on so you could get out of school. I, I mean, so you could uh, come and, uh, and, and see this lecture. Um, so what we will do, I'd rather concentrate on you. How you hear, how you perceive, how you can manipulate sound, and how your hearing often deceives you. But not as a mistake, and rather in order to tell you the truth that you need. And we'll see a couple of examples of that. We're going to start with a hearing test. Uh, not everybody hears the same, and this is just one way in which we all hear differently. Um, you're just reaching an age when you may start to lose your ability to hear up to 20,000 hertz. By middle age, it might be 12,000 only. Uh, that's normal. But uh, others have uh, hearing problems even much earlier. So uh, if you're not embarrassed, I'd like you to all raise your arms when the tone first starts. And in 30 seconds, it'll be over. And at that time, it'll be at 18,000 hertz. And uh, keep your hand up all the way if you hear it all the way. Uh, we might have to adjust the sound once, depending upon how loud it starts. And uh, this is not a scientific test. Don't worry too much if it goes away too soon, because sound is not uniform in this room, and so on. Um, your approximately frequency cutoff, if you have a watch and want to see how long the tone lasts for you from the moment it starts, is that formula there. So let's, uh, let's start. This is a false start. We'll start again with a different volume. Wow. So there's some of you are cutting off around 15,000, I think. Uh, I saw some adults. They were the first to go. Um, I take the prize, though. I have a congenital defect. Uh, my hearing has been, uh, gets worse with age, at starting at the high frequencies. I had to put my hand down after about two and a half seconds. I hear only to 2,000 or 2,500 hertz. But that's good for conversations. It's not good for noisy restaurants. Um, music only goes to well under 3,000. So that's not very close to 20,000. In fact, you can't even recognize a tune. If somebody plays a tune using only frequencies above 12,000, you can't recognize pitches. So uh, there's reasons for having hearing up to that. Ask your dog. You can hear much higher, but uh, um, you can get by without it. OK, so I'm going to begin by saying that tones are made of what are called partials. And some of the musicians in here, how many of you play an instrument? Wow, OK, so this is, this is largely for you. Um, I'm going to be using something called Max Partials, which is made in Max. Uh, the, the program was done by John Francois Charles. Max is a fairly expensive uh, visual and wonderful way of controlling your computer to make music and all sorts of things. You'll see some of them. Uh, but you can go to the website there. Uh, why you hear what you hear dot com. Uh, that's my website, and you can download these patches. They're called. 
And you don't have to buy the max program because uh, there's a max runtime version, which is free, and it works on all platforms. So um, there's the first page of the website, and there's lots and lots of information in there. But you see a thing called uh, max patches, which are uh, include the Do we have a pointer? I, I forgot to load the batteries in mine, but I can load them in. Yeah, that one doesn't have any batteries either. I think I've. Uh, so the patches are there, and this website is associated with this book of which I wrote. Uh, why you hear what you hear. It was published by Princeton University Press. Thank you. And um, it's 600 pages, and it's not full of art. Uh, most of the pictures I did for it are didactic, but there are 400 of them. And then there's all sorts of links, and, and on this website I just showed you, there are maybe 20 software programs that run on, uh, universally on all platforms that demonstrate aspects of sound and waves. So let's go to this max patch called PMS Partials. And I, for that, I bomb out of Keynote and uh, go to Max. And there is PMS Partials uh, running, not producing sound at this point. Uh, we're going to play. Uh, just to sort of warm up here, a major third. And one thing I want to do is uh, ask you, what's going to happen? You see, these are the uh, frequencies. Uh, by the way, in Max, you can do, even in this code, you can have 50 partials and make them any frequency you like. You can play with octaves that aren't octaves. Uh, a ratio of 2.1 to, 2 to 1, if you like, rather than 2 to 1. It's a wonderful experimentation tool. Uh, people even 20 years ago would have had to pay $200,000 or $400,000 for a laboratory to do what you can do now for free on your computer. And uh, a wonderful change has taken place. Of course, it doesn't mean that everyone's turned into an acoustic scientist or a sound scientist, but it does mean if you're interested, it's possible. Wonderful for science projects uh, of all sorts. There's so much that isn't known about sound, especially what I'm talking about today, uh, human perception of sound. Uh, and that gets into brain processing. And, and even still, some of the issues of the receptors in our ears are not understood. So there's so much research that can be done. So I'm going to ask you, uh, play it once again. What's going to happen if I uh, take down uh, this frequency? In fact, let's just, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll already destroy this. I'm going to have just one frequency. This is a partial. Uh, I'm taking down the intensity of all the others. This partial. Uh, is, I read it off there, 500 hertz. It's oscillating 500 times a second, and that's its amplitude. So I want you to hear one partial. It's a boring sine tone. And musical tones are made up of all these boring sine tones together. Uh, and these happen to be uh, based on an equally spaced set of frequencies, which makes them periodic as musical tones are. 100, 200, 300, but these, this starts at 400, then it goes to 500 and 600. This is a 4, 5, 6 ratio of frequencies, which defines in so-called just intonation the perfect tri uh, a major triad. And I've added a couple uh, overtones to make it 
which instruments would have if they played these three uh, tones. So now let me ask you, uh, you heard one sine tone, you heard the triad. What's going to happen when I knock out the bottom note, bottom partial here? Well, I hear the same pitch. It won't be a triad by definition because there's only two notes then, but I'm knocking out the lowest frequency. What will happen? Anyone want to guess? Raise your hand. Will it go up in frequency because you knocked out the lower one? Anybody? Yes. Go up in frequency. Oh, are you trained or something? This is wonderful. Uh, let's try again. Knock it out. That's the same pitch. It sounds different. It is different. The timbre has changed. We call it the quality of the sound, the timbre, but the pitch hasn't changed. Now, let's put it back. I'm going to knock out the middle one. In fact, let me put it back and play it quickly in succession. That went up an octave. Why? Now I'm going to try one more experiment with this, which is to, uh, by the way, I am going to ask and demonstrate quite a few things today to which there are answers known. There's no time. Uh, it takes a whole term to explain some of these things, um, to explain everything. But there's questions session, and there's demonstrations, some of which I may not get to. And I'm going to tell you more than once that I'd like you to come down afterwards. I think you have some time before the bus leaves to look at the exhibits, for example. If you're more interested in science, come down here and play with these Kaladni plates. They're amazing. Um, so I want to play, try another thing, uh, which is I'm going to uh, play this major triad. And I'm going to fool with this last partial, making it much louder. Whoops. No. Got to be more accurate with my thumb here. All right. Uh, I tell you what. Let's uh, stop the note. Listen, listen to that note. Let's kill these guys and play only this one partial. Again, and back to the note. How many of you heard that one partial ringing in the note? Did you notice it that much before? OK, that was just an example of the switch between what's called analytic listening and synthetic listening. Our hearing is amazing. We can pick out, with training, especially or if we're prompted like that, individual partials in a periodic tone. We can so-called hear them out. Uh, but normally, we think of the synthetic sound. It's kind of like the brain has all this information, but we're busy people, and it gives us an executive summary. Pitch and timbre and loudness, that's it. But Unlike hot and cold, we actually you know, can't say, oh, that's 73.4 degrees. You can't do that, because you can actually hear one single pitch out of many uh, with training or with prompting. Uh, I'm going to give you all a chance to do that again. Uh, here it is. Now listen for that when I do this. And let's try that 
with another one of the partials, the middle one here. So our pitch, our sense of sound is context dependent. What's just happened actually affects what we're hearing. It's not just quantitative, same thing every moment. And composers need to know that. Singers need to know that. Uh, now we're going to try a different way of producing a triad. This is a siren, another application you can get for free. A siren, a real one, is too big for me to bring. And also this one's much more flexible. Uh, is a disc with holes in it. And you have a pressure source coming uh, through a hose, which is right up against the disc. And normally the air doesn't come out until a hole goes by the disc. And then a puff of air comes out. And then the hole gets covered up again. And then the next puff of air comes out. And it comes out at a certain rate, depending upon how fast the disc is spinning. That's the siren. Uh, go back to the 1600s or so. And those puffs are pulsations, which, if they're fast enough, we interpret as sound. And that's just what's happening here in software. There's the pulses. And I can change that pulse if I want just by drawing with the mouse. And I've arranged there to be 20, 25, and 30 holes in three sets, three circles. And uh, we're going to start fairly slowly. And I mean really slowly. Uh, that's too fast. So that's almost like drum beats. And uh, Actually, there's a phase control here. I can change how the drummers are behaving. Because the holes are being rotated. And where that rectangle is, is the, is the air source. The one that's grayed out isn't playing. the change when I change the phase still. Oh, what the hell. A triad. A triad is in the ratio um, four, five, six, as those pulses are. One gives me uh, five times uh, five, one gives me five times six, one gives me five times four, 20, 25, and 30. And uh, I could set other combinations. You can play with this all day long and never get tired of it. At least I can. I'm not sure you can, but I bet some of you would. Uh, and that final tone you heard, you might think, oh, well, maybe it won't work if I chose a different phase. You must have chosen a special phase. Let me mess up that last circle of holes. Nope. You really can't hear much about the phase up at higher frequencies. 
and that's called Ohm's Law. And that's very interesting because the shape of the wave that's arriving at our ears is very different, can be very different, but we hear exactly the same thing. Because the shape of the wave arriving at our ears, the pressure wave, is, is in fact changing. Okay, when I change that phase. Let's get back to um, Oh, yes, I had one more thing to do in partials, which is I need to open up another thing called vowels, and we're going to learn about controlling your voice. Um, a thing called formants. So here are a bunch of partials, lots of them, but you notice they occur in clumps. And actually, my voice is creating the partials at about 85 hertz, plus twice times 85, plus three times times 85, but the AEIOU is all changing these clumps, which are called formants. I can say AEIOU in the same pitch. AEIOU, what has changed? The positions of these um, Partials have not changed, but the emphasis on them have changed. Uh, I don't know what vowels I made. I tried to make some, but maybe you think there's, these are vowels. I don't know. Let's try it. Oh, I'm sorry. The siren's still running. <laughs> Notice how the, how the lumps change. Those, that's how vowels are made. And you do that by vocal tract shape changes. And believe me, they're not small. Watch this guy. Why did Ken set the soggy net on top of his deck? <laughs> You're supposed to answer that, no. Now, if you didn't watch carefully, watch the tongue and how the opening, back of the tongue, roof of the mouth, even down there near the vocal tract uh, entrance, so to speak, the vocal cords. Why did Ken set the soggy net on top of his deck? Sometimes his nasal passage is open. Um, this is how we speak. The kings of formant tuning are thro the throat singers of tuva. They're able to make a formant, and so can you actually, with about half an hour's practice, uh, which is so sharply tuned to a certain frequency, it's like a ringing tone above the drone of their lower voice. Let's listen to this. Mm -hmm. guy's not whistling. That's that lower voice being, t the formants are tuned into a sharp uh, spike at very high frequency. Overtones, we call them, of his lowest frequency part of his voice. So, uh, how many of you are singers? Does anybody want to be an opera singer? Uh, well, I'm, whether you're an opera singer, uh, hopeful or not, there is a way to sing more loudly without ruining your voice, without even pushing harder. And this is how opera singers do it. Opera singers use what's called a singer's formant. It's actually a peak in frequency that you recognize as a ringing tone in some of the best opera singers that puts them above the highest frequencies that the orchestra has. How can one person compete with an orchestra doing a crescendo. Uh, but they do because they actually form, take some practice, a 
large area just past the vocal folds or vocal cords, uh, which enhances uh, a frequency range of about 3,000 hertz. There's the normal voice, and there's this extra formant. Uh, so let's, uh, I don't have an example of that, but I just wanted to mention it was discovered by somebody playing some records and who knew about these things, that Pavarotti, who is no longer with us, used a single formant, a, a, a singer's formant, uh, at about um, 2.8 kilohertz, as I just said, but Placido Domingo uses one around 1.4 kilohertz, which actually makes it a little harder for him to escape the orchestra's loud crescendos. Uh, but if you are playing with a certain pressure and your vocal cord are doing a certain amount of work and you open up that part of your vocal track, it gets louder without your pushing harder. Uh, we'll see more of that, but we have to listen to the talking piano first. Ich kann das ganz einfach ändern. Schon erstaunlich, wie genau plötzlich die Worte der Deklaration für einen internationalen Gerichtshof gegen Umweltverbrechen verständlich werden. Wien Modern war eine von zehn kulturellen Institutionen, die um einen künstlerischen Beitrag für die Veranstaltung im Dogenpalast in Venedig gebeten wurde. Diese Botschaft mit musikalischen Mitteln hörbar zu machen, ohne auf eine simple Vertonung zurückzugreifen, das war das ehrgeizige Ziel. Ich glaube, es ist teilweise verständlich, teilweise unverständlich. So, oh, this is the fun part. Um, again, we don't have time to do this today, but we could do this real time on volunteers. Uh, gender transformation. The way that piano worked was by controlling formants in part. Uh, there was nothing but the piano. There was no soundtrack behind it that you just heard. Uh, but they were definitely playing notes loud in some regions and soft in the other to, to make sound A's, E, I, O, and U, and so on. I don't know how they get the S's. Uh, but uh, the biggest uh, difference between males and females, uh, adults, is not their pitch of their voice, although that is one difference. Uh, the male has, on average, about a 17 centimeter vocal tract, the female about 15, which makes a shorter and therefore higher frequency. But what's much more important is where the formants fall. And with modern day computers, using a program called PROT, also free on the internet, it does much more than this trick, but it, it uh, it's, uh, allows you to record your, yourself or your friend and see what they would sound as the opposite sex. And uh, one hint, don't have a lot of extra extraneous noise going on. That confuses the program. Make it quiet in the room. All right. Uh, I have a couple of examples. Overall, we think this is a good project, but we do have some suggestions for you in narrowing your particular focus and direction. That's Kate, a teaching fellow in the class a couple of years ago uh, in her normal voice. And here she is after being transformed to a male voice. Overall, we think this is a good project, but we do have some suggestions for you in narrowing your particular focus and direction. So now let's go the other way. <laughs> let's go the other right. way. Hello, my name is Chase, and I am clearly a male speaker. The pitch and formants of my voice give me away. Heed, hid, head, had, Hod, hod, hood, hood. Now, he's got a deep voice. That sounds like it's hard to do. All right. Hello, my name is Chase, and I am clearly a male speaker. The pitch and formants of my voice give me away. 
heed, hid, head, had, hod, hod, hood, hood. So which one's more convincing, the female beginning or the male beginning? Yeah. All right, now about pitch perception. A very, very important thing to us all. And I'm going to bomb out of this again and, and play something from the Wolfram Demonstrations website, again, available to any computer. If you don't believe me what you're about to hear, you can try it from yourself on the Wolfram Demonstrations website. Um, and uh, I'm going to go to Mathematica. And uh, I actually downloaded the program and I own Mathematica so I could uh, get it to run myself and do some modifications, which I can't, uh, this picture here, which can change, that helps explain what's going on. But let's, let's listen to these tones. Would you say the pitch went up? Went up, right? That's exactly the tone we started with. <laughs> And to give you an idea of this, you might, if, if you thought that was a regular progression to higher pitch, then it should be high, going higher to go from 12 to 6, right? What? How about... It's not a regular progression, but it sounds like it. That's the tone we started with. So your sense of pitch is not what you thought it was. And how many of you have perfect pitch? So that doesn't mean you, the, the two of you who raised your hand, you can't tell the exact frequency of a tone, can you? The, down to the last hertz. But you can go to a piano and hit the right key. Is that correct? And uh, I'm just wondering, are people with perfect pitch, were you also surprised? Or did you know it was going on the whole time because you have perfect pitch? Was it surprising to get to the same note again still? <laughs> um, the analogy has been drawn with this Escher print. Um, these are infinite stairways. Every step is up, 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 and up, up, up. What the heck? So he drew it. So it's a very good visual analogy to what we just heard. Um, just to tell you, if you're, in case you're interested, you could ask a question later, maybe after. But um, this is what's called in the middle the autocorrelation of the sound. It's, uh, it's actually telling us how the sound tends to repeat itself later after having started uh, at zero time. It tends to repeat itself and be louder at very short intervals, thousands of seconds, and that gives us the pitch. Uh, but as we go in this progression, what's happening is all of the uh, intervals are moving closer to the origin. Closer means shorter time, means higher pitch. So why wouldn't, oh notice, the one getting closest is diminishing and others are coming in to take its place and it's back where it started. And so every 
interval that you heard is going up in pitch. Those peaks were moving in closer. But they're able to do so in a way which they repeated themselves after one cycle. So your sense of pitch isn't what you thought. Is that, is that a defect? Is there a better animal out there, another planet who hears better? No. You actually want to hear if on average things have gone up in uh, pitch, what we call pitch. Uh, and if you were somehow fed all this information, no, 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 this is really a sham, it's going to do this. I mean, you know, you just want to know if it went up in pitch. Uh, now, you can't do this with sine tones, but you do it with complex tones, with many partials in them, and as you just heard, it works. There's an analog to this, uh, the sort of lying to tell the truth. Uh, it's in that category I mentioned to you at the beginning. Um, I think you probably believe I'm going to lose this bet. But I'm going to claim that that square and that square are exactly the same shade of gray. So this is a visual lying to tell the truth, if you wish. Now, the truth really almost certainly is that this is a checkerboard, and there's white and black ones in alteration, and your brain has worked on this and says, what? OK, that one's got to be lighter. But let me show you. By the way, how many believe me? Why? Because otherwise I wouldn't be here doing this and look like a fool. <laughs> All right, we're going to prove it. Here goes. Just like music, it's context. What we feel, what we do, what we hear, what we see is so context dependent. And I believe that great art is really all about context. Even how you feel that day, if you feel like going to an art show, you know, are you receptive, are you not? But even, even a single painting can set its own context. And you start to get into it and delight in it. A good arrangement of many paintings set the context for each one that's there. Right? So that's kind of lying to tell the truth in a visual example. Ed Adelson at uh, MIT did that. There it is again in its original form. All right, now another thing about pitch. Uh, it's a musical instrument. It's used in orchestras. You know this. It's a chime. And a chime is something which uh, isn't quite as musical as a, uh, sorry. Well, you get to check it out again. It isn't quite as uh, uh, musical as, say, a clarinet. And uh, we're going to listen to this chime played over and over again. And it's the sound that coming out of the chime is made up of partials. And that frequency scale going vertically is linear, so that unevenly spaced lines, the partials are being plotted now horizontally, uh, means that the partials are not evenly spaced. This is not a musical tone in the sense of a clarinet playing a constant tone. But um, it's made up of partials. And what the soundtrack does is play each partial individually after uh, 
the whole tone is pay, played. And again, you'll hear this contextual emphasis of the, of the partial that was just played. You probably won't be able to avoid hearing it as if I had cheated and somehow raised its intensity in the next time the chime is played. And then we have a surprise at the end. The chime is now followed by a tone matching its nominal pitch or strike note. Yes, the pitch we think that is. If you give somebody a sign tone and play, ask him to play with it and say, match the sign tone, which has a definite pitch, there's only one frequency there. Uh, to the chime, people pick about 463. It isn't even one of the partials in the chime. Now, I have a test here for you. Get out your paper and pencil. No, uh, it's something else. Uh, we're going to play uh, the, the strike note, uh, sorry, we're going to play the chime four times and give you uh, four different pitches afterwards. One, two, three, four. Uh, and I want you to, to remember them. And then we'll have a vote as to which one is, matches the pitch best of the chime. How many would like to hear it again? One more try. Time for the vote. How many think it's the first one? How many think it's the second one? And the third? And the fourth? The answer is the third. That's 464. <laughs> now, there's really no right and wrong. I'm not, I'm not trying to assuage you when I say, if you feel it's closer for you, it is the closest one for you. But on average, when you do hundreds of people, it's around 463, 464 hertz. Without too much variation. Uh, now we're going to look at something called repetition pitch, something you've heard a thousand times and you didn't know what it was. And I want you to listen for it now for the rest of your life. Is that OK? Um, let's hear this train first. Did you kind of hear the pitch of the steam go up? Why would that happen? 
Well, here's, here's an illustration kind of showing what happens. You're getting a sound from two pathways. One is direct from the steam jet and one is bounced off the ground once. So the sound is repeated and it's the exact same sound because the steam is whatever it is and it's coming to you two ways. And that time delay gives you a sense of pitch. It's hardly a musical note, but you hear the pitch descending. Uh, as the train got further away, it was like you were further away from the train, so the pitch went up again. When it was closest to you, it was the lowest pitch. And actually, the path length difference is largest, and the time delay is largest when it's close to you, because they get so nearly parallel when it's far away, the path length difference isn't much. So we're going to do some click tests here. We listen to three closely spaced pairs of clicks. The first pair is separated by only 0 .003 seconds, or three thousandths of a second. The second by five thousandths, and the third by seven thousandths. First, though, we listen to a single click. Now we begin the double clicks. Now, instead of two clicks, we will use eight clicks. Each pair of clicks in the group of eight is separated by three milliseconds, five milliseconds, and seven milliseconds. So just repeating the clicks at different intervals gives us a sense of pitch, high or low. Uh, how many of you have parked a car at an, an airport parking lot? been with your family. You may have heard this. Plane landing overhead. Uh, the pitch was going up in the second half of that. And uh, I thought for years that that was the pilot gunning it or something as he got close to the uh, runway. Um, this is something called a sonogram. It plots both time and frequency. And you can see the soundtrack of the plane underneath. And notice, you can sort of see without explaining too much that there's a set of frequencies which are widely spaced at first, they become closer spaced and get down near the origin there, and then they become wider spaced again. And that's uh, directly taken from that soundtrack, and you can see the pitch going down, reaching a minimum, and then going back up. Uh, this is how we hear direction, is repetition pitch. This is why our ears have all those funny convolutions because those convolutions send repetitions of sound arriving at our ears back to us with time delays depending upon the orientation of our heads to the sound source. This is why it's almost impossible to really reproduce the sound of being in a concert hall uh, with headphones or even with earbuds. Um, and uh, there are wonderful studies showing uh, you know, you have about one, one degree error in how high and, and right and left. And if you uh, do something to this funny shaped ear, uh, you won't have that at all. You'll have some things, but not that at all. Uh, I want to tell you quickly one more thing about hearing. If you take two clicks, but you put them each one into this ear and one into this ear, and you play them at the same time, you hear one click. 
It sounds like it's coming out of the center of your head. If you delay one of them by a couple of milliseconds, the first one to hit, ah, it sounds like it's coming from over there. That is no surprise to you. But you know what is kind of a surprise? You don't hear the other click at all. It's just as loud. You know you, how, your, how your iPhone works. You're just playing the same two, same loudness clicks. You lose the other one entirely. Now think about it. This is, this is a, a, a wonderful insight into human nature. Is that a defect? Or would you rather hear two clicks and there'd be a, what, a meter in your eye saying, hey, the guy with the arrow is over there. Boom. You know, you, you, you want to know immediately that the sound is coming from there. Maybe it's prey you're after. You don't want to hear some indirect information that, yeah, 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 it's really coming from over there, even though it's the same loudness in both ears. So um, what happens in our brain somehow is the later click gets shut out. Uh, all right, let's do a few last thing, last minute things here on making sound. Um, I want to tell you that sound is all about acceleration. Uh, things that accelerate rapidly can make sound, but the bigger they are, uh, the better they are at it. Here's uh, the in inside guts of a music box. And if I play it, it's barely audible up there in the back, I'm, I'm sure. The tines are accelerating like mad, but they're very small. They are shaking the box, the, the frame a little bit, I can feel it. But if I put it here against the blackboard, so the tine shaking accelerates the frame, which accelerates the blackboard. The blackboard's a nice big area, and it has a far more efficient, the acceleration is rather high, but it's incredibly for a short time. So the displacement of the blackboard is way, way less than a micron just now. In fact, if you play a thousand hertz tone, uh, and your wall is the loudspeaker, so loud that it's damaging your hearing, 120 decibels, that wall isn't even moving a micron. So uh, let's try the, the fingernail trick. That's so simple to experiment. Why is it that this fingernail is incredibly slow? It's going much faster, much slower than the speed of sound. Why should you hear it? Nothing went anything like the speed of sound, but you hear that, but if I use my, the pad of my thumb, there's much less sound. What's happening is, even though you're going half a meter per second when you touch, the tabletop doesn't know you're there, and suddenly your fingernail touches and it goes, whoa, and it, it has to bend down and distort. That's called acceleration. And the tabletop is actually big. So it's quite good at uh, giving you that sound. And we haven't got time for silent string. We're going to have to do that uh, after or another time. Uh, so I want you to get a feeling for how fast sound is. And although this is a horrible way to show it, I admit, uh, I want you to, it really gives you a good idea. Picking up dust. At first it was a shock wave. That's long over and all you're seeing now is the evolution of a sphere of, uh, 
a sound, a sonic boom really, uh, moving out at the speed of sound. And uh, if I, and you can see that approach at the speed of sound right there of the sound wave. Okay, um, a speaking trumpet is an amazing invention and, and Samuel Moreland claimed he was the inventor of the speaking trumpet. Um, we know it's still in use, uh, but Anastasius Kircher claimed priority over Moreland. In fact, he had described it in a book some 20 years earlier. He also, this is one of Kircher's diagrams, invented all sorts of listening devices using it in reverse for uh, the, the royalty to listen in on, in on conversations from advisors, from the public at, at large. And you can see here's a, a talking head that listens down into this. These are probably, uh, this is a round table or something. And uh, that really worked. Um, but Kircher was, Moreland was very good at producing, at, at pushing himself. He curried favor with royalty. He gave away gifts. So Kircher said, ah, neither one of us invented it. Um, actually, Alexander the Great had one. And he had this picture of Alexander the Great's speaking trumpet. Uh, but what I like best about this guy story, which is very deep and interesting, uh, is what he said about a critic of one of his books, the critics of his, one of his books. He said, my book earned considerable praise from intelligent readers who were astonished by the novelty of its subject matter, but there was no lack of malicious, evil critics who attacked it with sarcastic arguments and many attempted corrections. All of these, however, were stupid or obtuse. So I, I, if, if, especially the academics in the audience, we now know how to respond to reviews to papers and so on. So, on. Um, so let's just finish with one of these other experiments, if I can get it going. Um, the greeting card and the food wrap should go, the, sorry, the greeting card and the horn should go fairly quickly. This is going to work. So how many of you have bought a greeting card? You know, we open it up and it plays music. And this is just the mechanism out of there, except there's kinds of you can record yourself. Testing, one, two, three, testing. That's me just saying testing, one, two, three, testing. Pretty boring. Now I'm going to put it into the throat of this horn. So, you see what I mean about manipulating sound? There's no power anywhere except the little battery that causes this thing to vibrate. Um, this didn't work any harder to make that much louder sound. And when you control your voice, there are ways to make it work no harder and be much louder, as I've already uh, indicated. Um, if I can get this working quickly, it's just about an hour since we started, so you know what, I think I'll... See, we're driving the, the tube of air at its resonance frequency, and that's resonance. Things get louder. 
But actually, that's only a tiny part, uh, part of the story that I discovered, much to my embarrassment, one day. Uh, I won't set it up. I'll just ask you to believe me, because we're running late. But I uh, set this loudspeaker to exactly the same frequency as that tuning fork. And uh, Three twenty. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> this is plugged in. Yeah, I don't know uh, why it's not playing, may not be plugged in. So I better go back to plan plan B, this was plan A. Just to tell you, you can take this tuning fork and do what I just did and it gets much louder. You, To my embarrassment, I took uh, the loudspeaker tuned to exactly the same frequency, I hold it over the top and nothing happens. <laughs> so if it's resonance, it doesn't get louder. And the really cool thing, the last, this is almost physics, but uh, this tuning fork vibrates like this, and it shoves air back and forth, and it does a pretty good job of it, but it shoves it out of phase with itself right nearby, and it turns out the sound is doing a damn good job canceling itself near the tuning fork. Uh, we call it acoustical short circuiting. Um, and it is loud enough for you to hear out there, but it's so loud if you hold it close to your ear. Now you say, of course it is, but actually it gets much louder than you would think if you get it close to your ear. You're in what's called the near field, <coughs> where it hasn't yet had a chance to cancel itself yet, the sound. What's happening here? Um, I have a very inefficient loudspeaker, so to speak. And if I can put it here and get this thing resonating, it shoots the sound out, out of phase with the tines and gets it out there without interfering. That's why it gets so loud. But the loudspeaker is already efficient. It doesn't need any help being efficient. Uh, you hold it near the tube and nothing changes because it's not more efficient. So it's not really resonance at all. Anyway, um, I want to end it there and with this uh, final mystery. But the events of the last few days have changed that. They have attracted scientists from all over the country and stump them all. How can a big chunk of Earth just get up and move away? The mystery barely unraveled by Leslie Donovan. From the air, you can see what scientists call a phenomenon. Somehow a large chunk of Earth was plucked from the ground and dropped down some 70 feet away. Uh, two waves coming together. Oh, right. Where they meet, you get an amplification of, uh, of the waves. Geologist Greg Behrens has never seen anything like this. He says not humans nor machines could have moved a chunk of Earth this huge without leaving a trace. You know, at first I was, I was rather skeptical, wondering if, if someone had come up here and was trying to pull a hoax. Uh, being in such a remote area like this, uh, the likelihood of it being discovered would be uh, almost nil to start with. And then looking around the area and seeing that, uh, that there isn't any indication that man had done it, uh, it's, it's real intriguing. Scientists figure the chunk weighs about three tons and perfectly matches the hole like a puzzle piece. 
The piece fits, but little else matches up. In the pit, the roots are intact. That means the chunk was torn from the ground or ejected. That can sometimes occur during an earthquake. In October, there was a mild earthquake centered 20 miles from the hole. But an earth ejection this huge would have to come from a major shaker. Nothing like that has been reported here. Meteors leave craters, but not holes like this one. So where does this leave scientists? Well, they'll study the hole for more clues, but the answer may come from something we don't understand. Barron's isn't ruling out the possibility of an extraterrestrial cause. Near Grand Coulee, Washington, Leslie Donovan, King 5 News. You don't suppose the wind did it? No, and I don't suppose that Jeff is right. Okay, we've seen and heard a lot of these different things. I'm running so late, I'm not going to review it. And thank you very much for your attention. It's been wonderful, and the Del Pietra family. Thank you. Do you have any questions for Dr. Heller? Anyone? Not one question? Don't be shy. The microphone would help, especially with my hearing. Wait, so um, what actually caused that? Do we know or no? Sorry? Do we know what caused that cookie cutter thing or no? On the mystery? I, you know, my hearing is so poor, I guess. What caused the, the, what, how did that happen with the earth? Oh. How did, get uh, how did that happen? That last one? Yeah. I think I know. Uh, it happened before on earth. Uh, a few times in Norway in the last uh, two or three decades. The oldest recorded example is a 20 by 50 foot strip of sod that got lifted many yards in the 1500, in the time of the Thuringians, whoever they are. And um, I believe what happens is a small, shallow quake suddenly goes boop, and rock, yeah, maybe 500 feet down or so, rock is not of uniform density uh, and it can focus energy just like lenses. And although it sounds extremely rare, um, think about once on the Earth every 50 years. That's rare. So on the whole surface of the Earth, once every 50 years approximately, this happens somewhere. And so the rocks are shaped just right, or the density is just right, and all the energy shows up at one spot, and the Probably, I wish somebody would check this. The uh, ground under that soil is very, is really rock, granite or something. And the granite goes boom, like maybe by an inch, and launches the sod. So it's a sound phenomenon, uh, but it's sound in rock. Nice question, thank you. Anyone else? Let's have some hands. Why are people tone deaf? Why are some people tone deaf? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I certainly don't know. I know that's got to do with deep uh, neurological issues. But um, uh, there, there are books written on this. I'm trying to think of the, the, my favorite book. Um, Oliver Sacks uh, wrote a book on music, musical perceptions. And uh, people with, people wake up in the morning and they look outside, where's the band? And the band is playing to them, but there's no band. And it could be a composer, a conductor, the music they're playing could be nothing like the music they like. And it may stick with them the rest of their lives. And it turns out if the uh, auditory cortex decides to send signals to your upper level conscious brain, even though it hadn't got a stimulus from your ear, 
you cannot tell the difference. So don't, I know it's not answering your question because I just don't know the answer, but th th this book is amazingly full of sound phenomena that can only come from neurological issues. Questions? Okay. Oops. Of course, you'd be on the other side of the room. <laughs> Okay, so in the beginning, you showed us these tones that could be broken down into smaller tone components, right? Partials, yes. Yeah, so these partials, can they be further broken down into different tones, or is that like the most basic? No, that's it. So that's like the most... I call the partials the atoms of sound. Cool. And uh, complex tones are like molecules. Nice. Made of atoms. Thank you. Good question. Maybe one more question. When a female is speaking and a male is speaking, what are some consistencies that one will notice um, with, when, uh, with a female's voice or a male's voice? Like um, when you showed us that thing, what a female um, changing the female voice to a male voice, uh, what makes a voice sound female? Like, are there like inflections on different sounds almost? Like, yeah, is that? Yeah. Um the computer program has to shift the average pitch, uh, but you don't want a Donald Duck effect. So you don't want to just shift the time, because that would make the words go faster or slower, depending on which direction you are shifting. So the computer can actually resynthesize uh, the whole speech, whatever one wants to say, and change the time it takes uh, to say it, for example, without changing the pitch. And this is used in advertising all the time. The formants aren't shifted in that case, just the time. And the words are spoken a little faster without the pitch going up. If the advertisement ran 10 seconds over when the announcer read it. Announcer walks home, gets in his car, you know, gets in his car and goes home. And the sound engineer compresses the tape to be 10 seconds shorter uh, he's speaking a little faster in his normal voice. So that's a flat uh, time only transformation which has to be made without changing pitch. And then females and males have these formants, these lumps, which are at different frequencies. They're characteristic. So when a female says an A, uh, there are three or four lumps in frequency, the formants. But they're distinct from a male A. And it's not that the pitch is different, but actually the vocal tract is somewhat different shape, it's somewhat longer. And so we recognize that. Our ears are very sensitive to that. And so the computer says, oh, there's the fourth bump, there's a third bump, there's a second one, there's the first one. I'm going to shift this over so it's like a female's bumps. Formants. And uh, it goes through that in about 15 seconds for 15 seconds worth of speech. Okay, and thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I think we better wrap it up now, and I think folks have buses to get and whatnot. So thank you, Dr. Heller. Thank you, everyone. Oh.